So we continue our discussion with Newton's third law of motion. As you might all know that we have already discussed Newton's first law which is the law of inertia that explains inertia of rest and inertia of motion and Newton's second law which prescribes force as the rate of change of momentum and from that we obtain force equal to mass into acceleration. Now Newton's third law of motion describes action and reaction, force when it is acted upon on a body as an action and the opposing force that is provided by the object or the surface on which that particular force is acting is called as the reaction. So Newton's third law of motion states that to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. To every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now this action as well as reaction are nothing but a pair of forces and as they are forces they are definitely vector quantities, they have a magnitude and they have a direction. So to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, it means that whether it is the action or the reaction, their magnitude is same. The value of the action or the value of the reaction is same but they are oppositely directed. And just remember that action and reaction, they do not act on the same model. This action and reaction, they never act on the same model. Act on two bodies, they do not act on the same model. Simultaneously they will act, but they will act on two different bodies. Action and reaction act simultaneously on two different bodies. So there are many such examples that we can realize while understanding what is action and what is reaction. So you can say that this action and reaction, they are equal. They are oppositely directed, they act on two different bodies, that means they act in pairs. You cannot separate the action and the reaction. You cannot separate action from reaction or reaction from action. They always act pairwise, they always act as a pair. Reaction act as a pair and they must act simultaneously. They do not act at two different time instants. They always act simultaneously, they act as a pair, they act on two different bodies. And they are equal in magnitude, but they are opposite in direction. So suppose you consider two objects, A and B. Suppose there is an interaction between two objects, A and B. Interaction between two bodies, say the body A and another body which is called as the body B. So in an interaction between two bodies, the magnitude of the action and the magnitude of the reaction are same. Suppose the magnitude of action You can say that the force that body A applies on body B is the action. Magnitude action is force applied by A on B. Quite possible it is the reaction also. But for the time being, just for demonstration I am saying that there is an interaction between two bodies A and B where the action is the force exerted by A on B. The force exerted on A by A on B is symbolically written as force exerted by A on B. FBA means force exerted by A on B. 
And suppose we say the magnitude of reaction, magnitude of reaction. magnitude of reaction and that reaction is suppose it is the force force applied by by B on A remember that what I have demonstrated a reaction that could have been the reaction also now the perspective of action or reaction it differs any one force can be called as action and the other opposing force can be called as reaction. So it is not necessarily that between an interaction between A and B, the force applied by A on B is the action, it, it will always will be the action, it might be the reaction also. Similarly, what I have said as the magnitude of reaction is the force applied by B on A, it could have been the action also. So the name does not matter here, it matters that there are two forces that acts whenever two bodies interact and one force is opposite of the other force but they are of the same value or same magnitude. Now this is denoted as force applied by B on A will be denoted as force applied by B on A, F A B. And as I have said that these two forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Mathematically this is written as F A B equal to F B A. That means their magnitude are equal. And whenever we try to indicate that their direction is opposite, we write in this form. We use the vector symbol, the arrow over these forces, and we write a minus symbol, which indicates that these two forces are equal but oppositely directed. Their value is equal, their magnitude is equal, but they are oppositely directed. So this is what Newton's third law of motion demonstrates. So we can demonstrate several examples. Suppose the first example, let me take an example. Suppose a, a book is resting on a table. A book resting on a table. So suppose this is a table on which a book has been kept. So, the weight of the book is acting in the vertical downward direction. The weight of the book, this might be called as the action. And by Newton's third law, the surface of the table will exert a force on the book. And that force is called as the force of reaction, which is also called as normal reaction. This force is called as the normal reaction because it is perpendicular to the surface of the table. Because it is perpendicular, it is called as normal reaction. So here this force is W is the action and N is the reaction force. And they are equal and they are oppositely directed. So whenever, suppose I am trying to push this board with my palm. Whenever I try to push this board with my palm, definitely I am exerting a force on the board. The surface of the board will exert equal force, that is the force of reaction on my palm. So in this situation, there are two forces. The force that I apply is the action and the reaction that the board apply, which will be perpendicular to the surface of the board, is the force of reaction. Several examples you will come across in your daily life. Whenever someone tries to fire a bullet from a gun, a force is exerted whenever the trigger is pressed, the force is exerted on the bullet and as a reaction the gun experiences a recoil. That means if the bullets move in the forward direction, suppose on pressing the trigger the bullets move in the forward direction, as a reaction the gun will recoil in the backward direction. So that is a re reaction force. Whenever a boatman is trying to push a boat ahead in water. He definitely exerts a backward force with the oars. 
a boatman and a boatman when tries to move ahead on the surface of water on the surface of a lake or on the surface of a pond on the surface of a river whatever it is on the surface of water he applies a force in the backward direction using his force force applied by the oars and as a reaction there is a equal and opposite force in the forward direction on the boat which helps the boat to move forward so there also exists a action reaction pair in order to move the boat from the shore also the boatman pushes the shore <coughs> by a bamboo or a oar and the shore definitely pushes the boatman along with the boat in the forward direction which is definitely the force of reaction in rocket motion also whenever some fuel is burned inside the rocket the burned gases which are produced at a very high temperature and high pressure they are expelled out of the rocket through a nozzle so in this situation the rocket is exerting a force on the gases to expel them and the outgoing gases will definitely exert a equal and opposite force on the rocket due to which it moves in the forward direction so in the case of rocket motion also this is possible so suppose a rocket is moving vertically upwards it is trying to move a vertically upwards direction so gases are expelled so the rocket forces it exerts a force suppose f that is called by action to expel the gases out of the nozzle and these outward outgoing gases they exert a force as a reaction they exert a reaction force on the rocket which helps it to move in the forward direction whenever we are walking on a road we also apply newton's third law of motion so suppose a person is walking on a road he exerts a force on the ground but that force is slantingly exerted motion of a man on the floor so suppose the person concerned will exert a force on the ground in a slanting manner and as a reaction the ground will offer a force in the exactly opposite direction of same magnitude so suppose this is the reaction now actually this reaction force has two parts or two components this reaction force has two components one is called as the vertical component and another is called as the horizontal component this vertical component of the reaction balances the weight of the man and this horizontal component of the reaction it helps to walk forward so definitely without our knowledge we are applying newton's third law of motion in order to walk on the surface of a road or on the floor helps to walk forward i repeat whenever the man tries to walk on the floor or on the road he exerts a force slantingly on the road or on the floor and that force might be called as action the floor suppose this is the surface of the floor the floor will exert a force in exactly the opposite direction which might be called as a reaction this reaction has two portions or two components or two parts and those components are the vertical component vertical component of the reaction force and h this refers to the horizontal component of the reaction force this vertical component balances the weight of the person and the horizontal component helps the person to move in the forward direction
there are many such examples you will definitely come across and this that will help you to demonstrate the terms third law of motion let us take another experimental demonstration of this law with the help of two spring balances so experimental demonstration suppose you take two spring balances a spring balance is something like this there is a hook attached to one end and there is a ring attached to one end and this is calibrated or uh, some markings are always given here in order to read the weight of an object or exactly the force so we can help uh, sorry we can apply a pulling force on this particular spring balance this part is tied to some fixed surface and on this surface we apply the pulling force so suppose this spring balance is fixed to the ceiling then it will be suspended by the help of this hook to a ceiling and suppose the force that is to be applied the force is applied on this particular ring and a spring will read the value of the force in newton or in kg or whatever it is so suppose we are having two such spring balances which have been mounted side by side identical spring balances and suppose they are fixed to a rigid wall one hook goes over the ring of one and another hook is connected to this wall this rigid wall and here there is a ring on which a pulling force is applied so these are two identical spring balances suppose you say spring balance a spring balance b this is spring balances which measure the amount of force exerted they are identical so if i apply the force f on this one on this particular spring balance a both these spring balances will show the same reading the spring balances will show the same reading because whenever i am trying to pull it this spring also the spring in the spring balance b will pull will get pulled the spring in the spring balance a will also get pulled and as action and reaction are equal and opposite they will <coughs> show the same reading so the force exerted by b sorry by a on b will be in this direction force exerted force exerted on b by a will be in this direction because a will definitely pull it in this direction and as a reaction this can be called as action and as a reaction the force on a due to b will be in this direction and both will show the same reading same reading is shown because action and reaction are equal and opposite is shown by a as well as b so this experiment can help you to realize how action and reaction are equal and they are opposite react So now we we'll discuss universal law of gravitation. The universal law of gravitation is a law that demonstrates the gravitational pull exerted by a particle on another particle. And this law is universally accepted, and hence it is called as universal law of gravitation. It is also true for every particle of this universe. each part particle of this universe having a definite mass can attract every other particle of this universe having a definite mass so that's why this law of gravitation is also called as the universal law of gravitation so suppose there are two particles 
Suppose there are two particles, particle A and particle B. So this is suppose particle A and this is suppose particle B. Suppose the mass of particle A is m1 and the mass of particle B is m2. Then there will exist a force between these two particles. The force of gravitation is purely attractive. Particle A will attract particle B and particle B will attract particle A with a certain force. That force is called as the gravitational force between the pair of the particles. And that gravitational force, let me call it F, or the force of gravity, or gravitational pull you can say, because it is always attractive. This gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses of the particles. That means, more is the mass, more strong is the force, more stronger is the force, or more, more prominent is the force. So, the force of gravity or the gravitational force of attraction between a pair of particles separated by a certain distance is proportional to the product of the masses and this force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance of separation. Suppose these two particles are being separated by a distance r, they are kept r apart, then the force of gravity or the gravitational pull is inversely proportional to the square of the distance of separation. Now if the distance increases, then this force becomes weaker and if the distance is smaller, that means if the particles are very close to each other, the force of gravity is quite a strong force and it is always proportional to the product of the masses, means more is the mass, more strong will be the gravitational pull. These two together is called as Newton's universal gravitational law or Newton's universal law of gravitation. So if I combine these two, I will get F is proportional to m1 m2 by r square. And in mathematics, whenever we eliminate the proportionality symbol, we multiply with a constant and that constant in this case is denoted by capital G and it is called as the universal gravitational constant. G is equal to, G is called as the universal gravitational constant, universal, so this G is called as the universal <coughs> gravitational constant or simply the gravitational constant and its value is 6.67 into 10 to the power minus 11 Newton meter square per kg square Newton meter square per kg square so this is a constant that, that can be determined by a special method which is called as the Cavendish method we need not discuss this because it is much beyond the scope of our syllabus so the value of G it is universally accepted and it is approximately 6.67 into 10 to the power minus 11 newton meter square per kg square. So, you can define what is capital G with respect to this formula. So, you can say that capital G or gravitational constant is the force between a pair of particles whose masses are 1 kg and the distance of separation is 1 meter. What I am saying is, if both the masses are 1 kg each and if the distance of separation between them is 1 meter, then you can say G is equal to F. So, you can define the universal gravitational constant as the force of gravitational pull between a pair of masses of mass 1 kg or between a pair of unit masses you can say separated by a distance 1 meter apart. They are kept 1 meter apart. So, 
what we realize from Newton's law of gravitation is that the force of gravity or the gravitational pull between any two objects in this universe is always attractive force. The force is always proportional to the product of the masses and the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, square of the separation between them. Remember that this force F is always attractive. Always attractive. Now, as I have discussed in the case of contact and non-contact forces, the universal gravitational pull or the force of gravity is a non-contact force. It is a non-contact force because the two particles need not be in contact, but still the force of gravity will act between them. And as it is a non-contact force, definitely it depends upon the square of the separation. It is inversely proportional to the square of the separation. Now again, I repeat, I have said that while discussing universal law of gravitation, that the force of gravity is acting between a pair of particles. Particles means that their size is extremely small. However, this law is applicable to large objects also. Now whenever we consider large objects, the distance of separation between those two objects is actually the distance of separation between the center of masses. You can remember this. If it is true for particles or point masses, that means the mass of those bodies are concentrated to a particular point. They are so small that their mass is concentrated to a particular point and because the law is applicable to particles, it is applicable to large objects also. For large objects. So for large objects, the distance of separation is the distance between their center of masses. That means if you take suppose two spherical bodies, these are definitely two large bodies. Suppose this is body A and this is body B. And their entire mass is assumed to be concentrated at the center. So the mass of the entire body is concentrated at this point and mass of the entire body B is concentrated at this point. So now the distance of separation will be the distance between their center of masses. And the entire mass of the body A, suppose it is M1, then M1 is concentrated at the point O1 and entire mass M2 of this body is concentrated at this point O2. So for large bodies, we take the distance R as the distance of separation between the center of masses. Whereas for particles of point masses, whose mass is concentrated at a point, the distance of separation is just the distance between the particles only. Now, using this universal law of gravitation, we can define the acceleration due to gravity. So, again, Suppose we consider the force of attraction between an uh, object on the surface of the earth and the earth itself. Suppose this is the earth, its center or its center of mass is suppose the point O. That means the entire mass of the earth is concentrated at its center, that is center of mass also you can say. So suppose the mass of the earth is M, capital M. And we consider an object which is very small with respect to the earth itself. That object is kept on the surface of the earth. And suppose this small object has mass small m. The distance of separation between the object on the surface of the earth and the center of the earth is capital R, that is the radius of the earth. So this is mass of earth. Capital R is the radius of the earth. And M is the mass of the body which is on the surface of the earth. So if I apply Newton's gravitational law between small m and the entire earth, it will be capital G, small m, capital M. And now the distance of separation is capital R obviously. So this is capital R square. Now we know that the force of gravity exerted by the earth on any object on its surface 
is the weight of the body. So in this case, the gravitational pull is equal to the weight of the body. Weight of the body whose mass is m. Whose mass is m. And as you all know, that this weight can be expressed as mg. So I can write small mg equal to capital G, small n capital M by capital R square. So from this I get small g is capital G M by R square. So this small g is the acceleration due to gravity and it is equal to the universal gravitational constant into the mass of the earth divided by the square of the radius of the earth. For any other planet, the g will change definitely because in that case, suppose for Jupiter, you want to find the acceleration due to the gravity of the surface of Jupiter, then you have to consider the mass of Jupiter and the radius of Jupiter. So the value of g that I have demonstrated is a technique of calculating the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of any planet. Similarly, you can calculate the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the moon. If you calculate the accelerate of acceleration due to gravity on the surface of moon, you will realize that acceleration due to gravity at the surface of moon, suppose I denote it by gm or g moon, that is one sixth of the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the earth. And so, objects are quite lighter when they are on the surface of the moon. On the surface of the moon, your weight will reduce by 1 6 times. So, if your weight is 48 kg on the surface of the earth, on the surface of the moon, it will become 48 by 6, that is 8 kg. So, this is acceleration due to gravity. And we know its standard value on the surface of the earth is approximately, the value is approximately 9.8 meter per second square. And we sometimes take the rounded up value as 10. Unless otherwise specified, the value of G, the average value of the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the moon, sorry, on the surface of the earth is 9.8 meter per second square. Obviously, G varies with height above the surface of the earth, it varies with depth below the surface of the earth, it also varies with latitude. Now, whenever we are studying motion under gravity, that means when an object is thrown with a certain velocity above the surface of the earth, or when an object is dropped with the, from some specific height and it reaches the surface of the earth, those type of problems are nothing but problems in a straight line where we use the value of g. What I am saying is that suppose an object is thrown vertically upwards. An object thrown vertically upwards. Vertically upwards with velocity small u. Suppose in time t, time t, this object, it reaches height h. So this is, this problem is similar to motion in a straight line, but the only difference is that in motion in a straight line we consider certain values of acceleration and retardation, but for motion under gravity, instead of considering different values of acceleration and retardation, we consider the value of g or small g. So in that case, what you can say, the final velocity, final velocity, will be v equal to u minus g because for vertically upward motion for vertically upward motion the body is retarding because the value of g acts in the opposite direction the value of g is acting towards the center of the earth and you are throwing an object above the surface of the earth so the body is definitely retarding the force of gravity is opposing the motion of the body when it is thrown vertically upwards 
So if I throw an object vertically upwards, the force of gravity is opposing its motion. So it will retard and therefore g will be taken as negative. So this will be similarly the height h that this body will achieve in time t will be ut minus half gt square. And another formula that was used was v square minus u square is 2s that will become v square minus u square is 2 into minus g into h. Similarly, if it is asked that the, what will be the maximum height achieved by a body when it is thrown with a velocity u. Now remember, whenever the body achieves maximum height, at maximum height, the final velocity becomes u. Because when it reaches the maximum height, at that moment it stops momentarily and then it tries to come downward. So when, when the object has reached its maximum height, its velocity becomes zero. So at your maximum height, velocity becomes zero. So using this equation, if v is zero, then you can get maximum height is u square by 2g. So in that case, you can just remember that it is u square by 2g. And the time to achieve the maximum height, you can use this equation, v becomes zero. So time to achieve the maximum height, time to achieve maximum height, this t becomes u by g. So in time u by g, the object will achieve its maximum height. A similar, most similar type of equations you can apply whenever an object will drop from a certain height. So, I hope you have noted it. So, if an object, an object is dropped from height h above the answer. And in time t, it reaches the ground. In time t, it reaches the ground. Then final velocity is obviously u minus gt. Sorry, final velocity will be u plus gt because whenever the object is dropped from certain height, the, its motion is vertically downwards. The value of g is also positive because the gravitational pull is definitely supporting the motion of the body. So, these equations will change. Now, whenever it is dropped from a certain height, its initial velocity is zero. Remember that whenever an object is simply released from a certain height, its velocity is zero. You can definitely project it with a velocity. You can just deliberately provide a velocity when it is released. But if you say that it is simply released or dropped, the initial velocity is taken to be zero. So if u is zero, if u is zero, then definitely the final velocity will be gt. If u is zero. Similarly, with this equation also, if it is dropped from a height h, then if u is zero, initial velocity is zero, then this will become h equal to half gt square. And if u is zero, then this g is again positive. So in that case, this will be the equation, but if u is zero, then this equation will become v square equal to 2gh. So you can definitely apply the same formula that we learned for motion in a straight line here. But remember that for vertically upward motion, take small g as negative, and for vertically downward motion, take small g as positive. I repeat, for vertically upward motion, for vertically upward motion, consider g to be negative and for vertically downward motion,
downward motion consider g to be positive and then use the same equations that you have used in motion along a straight line to solve different numericals so let us solve two numericals the first numerical is a body falls from the top of a building and reaches the ground 2.5 seconds later you have to find how high is the building and it is given that the value of g is 9.8 meter per second square so let me solve the first problem so it falls from the top of a building you have to find the height of the building the time is given because it falls or it is released from the top of the building the initial velocity <coughs> should be taken as zero and the formula h equal to ut plus half gt square because u is zero so ut is zero it is just half gt square very simple problem so therefore h is equal to half into 9.8 time is given is 2.5 square so that is 4.9 9.8 by 2 is 4.9 2.5 25 volt square is 625 2 plus is decimal will sift so this is 6.25 6.25 into 4.9 it is approximately 30.65 so this is a very simple problem the second one a stone is dropped freely from the top of a tower and it reaches the ground in 4 seconds you have to find the height of the tower the same formula you will apply here Again, your initial velocity is zero because it has been dropped freely. It reaches the ground in four seconds. Time is given. So your formula is again half g t square because remember that u is zero, so u into t is zero. So this is half into g value is ten is given here, and t is four. So this is four square. Four square is sixteen. Two into five is ten. Sixteen into five is eighteen. So the height of the tower is eighteen meters. 30.65 probably the calculation is not accurate 4.9 into 6.25 4.9 into 6.25 30.625 30 30.625 meter so the next problem is a pebble is dropped freely in a well from its top it takes 20 seconds for the pebble to reach the water surface. You have to take g as 10 meter per second square and the speed of sound is 330 meter per second. Then you have to find the depth of the water surface and the time when the echo is heard after the pebble is dropped. So let us solve the problem bit by bit. The first part is time taken by the pebble to reach the water surface t that is 20 seconds it is given. The value of g is 10 meter per second square. Now the water has been, sorry, the pebble has been dropped into the well. So suppose this is the well and from some height above the water surface in the well, this pebble has been dropped. So suppose the pebble has been dropped from here, it is released from this point, suppose. Now because it is moving vertically downwards, the value of g which is also vertically downwards is to be taken as positive you have to find the depth of the water surface that means this will be the depth suppose h depth of the water surface is suppose h from the point where it is dropped to the water surface the depth is h because it has been just released its initial velocity can be taken as zero so again h equal to half gt square that will be a formula half into 10 into t is 20 20 square 20 square is 400 10 by 2 is 5 400 into 5 is obviously 2000 meter so the water surface is 2000 meter below the point from where it has been dropped so the first part has been solved Second is the time when the echo is heard after the pebble is dropped. First of all, the pebble will take some time to reach the surface of water and then the sound will propagate in the opposite direction. 
So, if you look at the problem, the first part, sorry, the second part of the problem is the time when the echo is heard. So, it, it will be solved in two steps. Time to reach the water surface is already given, 20 seconds. No need to calculate that. Now, sound wave will propagate in the opposite direction. And suppose the time taken by sound is t dash, then t dash will be equal to time is distance by speed. So distance is the height or the depth of the water surface that is h it's divided by the speed of sound that is v which is given as 330 meter per second. So this is equal to 2000 by 330, 2000 by 330 that is 200 by 33. 200 by 33 is 6.06 .06. so total time is equal to this 20 that is t plus t dash that is 20 plus 6.06 .06. that is 26.06 .06 seconds is the time after which the ego has been heard. So, the next problem is, a ball is thrown vertically upwards from the top of a tower with an initial velocity of 19.6 meter per second. The ball reaches the ground after 5 seconds. You have to calculate the height of the tower and the velocity on reaching the ground. This problem can be done in many different ways. But the most easiest way I will tell you, suppose from the surface of the ground, this is the tower suppose and the ball has been thrown from the surface of the tower. The ball is, <coughs> is thrown vertically upwards from the top of the tower. So this is the tower suppose, its height is h and the ball is thrown vertically upwards with a velocity suppose u equal to 19 meter per second. Now the ball will go, it will achieve the maximum height and then it will come back to the ground. And when it comes back to the ground, it hits the ground with a velocity v suppose. This will be the suppose path followed by the ball. It achieves the maximum height and then it comes downward and hits the ground with velocity v. Now, the equations that we use in motion along a straight line Say for example, s equal to ut plus half at square or v square minus u square is 2s. All, in all those equations, velocity and displacement are definitely vector quantities. So you see that the displacement of the ball, because it has been projected from this point above the top of the tower and it reaches this particular point on the ground, its initial position is this one and its final position is this one. So what is the displacement? The displacement is definitely h. Distance covered is quite different. Distance covered is from this point to the maximum height, then from the maximum height to the ground. But s equal to ut plus half at square, that s is displacement. So this is the displacement. Because if the ball has been thrown vertically upwards from the point a and reaches the point b on the ground, then ab is your displacement. Now, for vectors, we consider directions also. So, when the ball is going upwards, g is taken as negative. When it is going downwards, g is taken as positive. But the direction of g is always vertically downwards. Direction of g is always vertically downwards. That's why for upward motion it is negative and for downward motion it is positive. Now, the time is also given. Time is not a vector quantity, it is a scalar quantity. So velocity on reaching the ground that we have to calculate and we have to calculate the height of the tower. Because the time is given, the initial velocity is given, you can apply the equation h equal to ut plus half gt square. Now, as per direction we will use, you see that the displacement is from this point to this point because this is the initial position and this is the final position. So displacement is in this direction. So displacement is vertically downwards. The displacement is 
along A. The displacement is displacement AB. This is downwards, your G is downwards, but initial velocity U, this is upwards. The displacement is downward, G is downward, U is upward. So, we will use directions and accordingly we will use positive or negative sign for U, displacement and G. So, this displacement is obviously H. So, you see that displacement H is vertically downwards. I repeat, G is vertically downwards whereas the initial velocity is vertically upwards. So, vertically upwards direction, suppose we consider that as the negative direction and vertically downward direction as the positive direction. So, or you can take the opposite situation also. Suppose the upward direction would take it as negative and the downward direction you take it as positive. So, what happens? H is downward, so this will be taken as minus H. U, it is vertically upwards, sorry, as per this convention, H is vertically downwards, H I am taken as positive. U is vertically upwards, it will be taken as negative. The value of U is 19.6, time is 5 plus half in G is vertically downwards, it is positive, it is 9.8, time is 5, 5 square. So what you get is H equal to minus 19.6 into 5, minus 19.6 into 5, this will be 98 plus, this is 25 into 4.9, 25 into 4.9 this will give you 122.5 and if you subtract 98 from it you will get 24.5 so ultimately you get the result as 24.5 meters so height of the tower is 24.5 meter you can note it down remember that one of the directions you have to consider positive and the other direction we have to consider negative. I have considered vertically upward direction as negative and vertically downward direction as positive. So, so accordingly, G is taken as positive. The displacement is in the vertically downward direction, it is taken as positive. Whereas U, which was in the vertically upward direction, that was taken as negative. So as per this, the problem is this one. Next part of the question, velocity of the ball on reaching the ground. Again, you note the directions properly. Velocity of the ball on reaching the ground, you can use V equal to U plus GT. You can use V square minus V square is 2 GH. Whatever is convenient. So let me use V equal to U plus GT. Because initial velocity is given, time is given. So suppose V equal to U plus GT I am using. Now I have to apply proper sign. So see in this situation your G is vertically downwards. The velocity when striking the ground is vertically downwards. Initial velocity is vertically upwards. So as I have considered vertically upward direction as negative. So this Q will be negative minus 19.6. G is vertically downwards. So this is 9.8 and time is obviously 5 seconds. So this is 19.8 into 5, 49, 49 plus 19 minus 19.6. So this is 49 minus 19.6, which you will get as 29.4. So this is 29.4 meter per second. So the velocity on striking the ground is 29.4 meter per second. I, I repeat again, I have considered vertically upward direction as positive, vertically downward direction, sorry, vertically upward direction as negative and vertically downward direction as positive. I could have taken it in the opposite sense also. You can take vertically upward direction as positive, vertically downward direction as negative and accordingly you have to change the sign or change the 
and directions of G, V, U and H. So this is the easiest way of solving the problem.